Okay. Um, Yay, perfect. Can see it now. Thanks, Aaron. Now, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Great. Sorry, just uh, some starting off difficulties. Right. So, um, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm really excited to um, to to be here and to talk about um, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, learning loss and inequality. Um, this is joint work together with my friends and colleagues, um, Per Engsel and Mark Wehrhagen, who, like me, are at the Leverhulme Center for Demographic Science at the University of Oxford. <clears throat> and this paper, um, or this presentation, is largely based on a paper that we wrote together, uh, which uh, was published in PNAS about a year ago. Um, so, as other people have mentioned, um, School closures have been one of the sort of main non-pharmaceutical interventions that governments throughout the world have implemented in an effort to curb the spread of COVID-19. As you can see here, at some point, um, virtually sort of all countries throughout the world implemented some form of school closures. Um, and unlike other or like relative to other um, policies, school closures are also somewhat sticky in the sense that they are um they take a, a fairly long time to be um revoked or reduced once they've been implemented um <clears throat> now at the time of the actual um implementation of the school closures um governments throughout the world um, and educators throughout the world were sort of concerned over the impact that these school closures would have for student learning. Sort of the UN call it, you know, the largest disruption to education in history, um, with about 95% of the world's school population being affected. Um, and so parents and educators and students understandably were concerned um, what the impact of those closures would be for um, learning outcomes. But the problem was that um, data to actually understand and to study the consequences of these school closures was extremely hard to come by. And that's because testing data actually takes a long time to be released to the public if it is released at all. Um, and so we are actually only now seeing, you know, more and more studies that sort of look at or that try to unpack the impact that um, these school closures have had on student learning. So in our, in our study, we were sort of fortunate to very early on have access to exceptionally rich data from the Netherlands um, and so we're able to evaluate the effect of school closures on student learning during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, <clears throat> the other reason for why it's sort of difficult to obtain robust estimates of um, how... Aaron, just to say, um, are your slides supposed to be changing? Because we've still got the, the first slide. Oh, up. no. Oh, no. OK, well, that's that's problematic. OK, so can you... They, they have been changing. Yeah, let me just we've got a new one now i think may, have you got maybe if let you me don't just, have the slides on your screen it it pauses can you the see them now can you see the move now yeah yeah okay apologies for that so um you haven't missed too much okay <laughs> um thanks so one of the reasons for why it's sort of difficult to obtain robust estimates for the impact of um school closures on student learning is because you actually need a fairly um uh you, you need sort of fairly detailed uh, data for one you need information both before and after the schools closed you also need a credible control group and you need to find a good way to adjust for sort of attrition in um in um in your sort of sample right and so if you look at for example the the plots down here uh, if you would just compare sort of two years with one another it'd be problematic because you would sort of have this underlying time trend in performance over time that you would, ha would have to somehow adjust for in your analysis. Um, and so you really need to be able to have access to, you know, really kind of quite detailed data on, um, on really quite detailed testing data. Right, um, I hope my slides uh, are moving now. And um, please interrupt me if you can't see them. Um, so in this paper, we rely on the Dutch educational system, which conveniently for us conducts nationally standardized tests twice in an academic year, once midway through and once at the end of the academic year. And so we, through a partnership with um, a private institution, were able to obtain access to a representative sample of around 15% of all students, of all primary school students in the Netherlands, 
which equates to around 350,000 students. And because this is individual level data, we um, are not only able to examine the overall impact of the school closures, but also look at how the impact differs across student characteristics and across study subjects. Great. Um, so as I said, um, there are these nationally standardized tests across the Netherlands, which take place twice in an academic year, once midway through the academic year at around January and February, and once at the end of the academic school year at around June and July. And you can see that in 2020, the school closures happened right in between those two testing moments. Um, and so this fortuitously for us allows us to compare students' progress at the end of the year test to their performance at the middle of the year test, and then compare that progress to performance in the previous three years where there was no lockdown. Now, <clears throat> you can already see here that um, attrition is a serious problem in um, 2020 after the schools reopened, where, which, um, where much fewer students sort of returned to take the test um, after schools reopened relative to previous years. And this is not only a concern in the Netherlands, but is in fact a concern across the across the world where sort of schools only selectively tested every second classroom or only selectively tested some students. And so we really need to um, find a way to address this attrition to have any trust in um, our effect estimates. And sort of I'm going to um, talk you through what we did to ease your concerns um, later in our presentation. Now, um, the analysis lends itself or the data lends itself very well to a pretty straightforward difference in differences design where we compare students progress in 2020 at the end of the year test so after the schools reopened to the middle of the year test so before schools closed and then compare that progress to progress in the previous three years where there were no school closures and so our main analysis is a pooled analysis from 2017 to 2019 where our sort of variable of interest is T, right, which denotes the treatment year, um, so 2020, when the schools actually closed. And um, to get sort of more accurate estimates, we also control for the time between the time that elapsed between the testing dates, as well as for a linear time trend. Note that um, the, the um, testing grades that we look at are in percentile terms. And so we actually expect there to be no movement on average between the middle of the year and the end of the year test. Um, so that means that if a student um, performs at the 50th percentile at the middle of the year test, on average, we expect them to perform at, 50, at the 50th percentile um, during the end of the year test. Of course, some students will perform better or worse than expected. Um, <clears throat> And if you look at the raw difference, this is actually exactly what we see. So for 2017 to 2019, um, we see that our estimates, are, sort of this difference clusters nicely around zero with some sort of random variation on either side um, um, across all our three didactic areas. So maths, reading and spelling, as well as for a composite score. Um, but then we also see that in 2020, which is here marked in red, we can sort of see a marked leftward shift in um, that distribution, which already suggests that sort of some learning loss take, took place, right? Um, and this is what we can see sort of more specifically when we look at the main results. Um, here we can see that on average, students lost about three percentage, percentile points in the national re distribution relative to a normal year. So that means that if a student uh, performed at the 50th percentile, um, um, prior to the lockdown, they now performed at the 47th percentile after the lockdown. Most problematically, students from uh, disadvantaged social backgrounds were particularly affected. Um, sort of students whose parents have low or very low parental education suffered losses up to 55% greater than their more educated peers, which really um, sort of confirmed some of the worst worries that educators had educators and researchers had going into the pandemic that um, the that the pandemic would not only lead to an overall loss of learning but would also exacerbate inequalities between sort of more advantaged and more disadvantaged students um, by contrast we find no marked differences across student uh, sex student grade or subject domain <clears throat> 
Now, to validate the assumptions um, of our identification strategy, we we'll also we sort of replicate the analysis, but um, use 2018 and 2019 as the treatment year. And because no lockdown took place during those times, we would obviously expect there to be no effect. And this is exactly what we find here. So you can see that our effect estimates sort of cluster nicely around zero with some random variation um, um, across the two years. So this, so this sort of validates the assumptions of our identification strategy. Um, but obviously the issue that still remains is uh, the problem of attrition that I highlighted earlier. And that is that many people, uh, many pupils in 2020 did not take the end of the year test. And so we wanna find a way to address this issue to really have confidence in our effect estimates. <clears throat> and the way sort of, you can see this problem in the two histograms on the right-hand side, whereas in 2019, most students across most schools took the end of the year test. In 2020, there seemed to be a lot of schools where no student was tested or where only sort of every second or every third or every fourth student was sort of selectively tested. Um, and so to address this issue, we sort of uh, um, do a number of things. First, we, you know, throw a bunch of um, additional controls at the regression to see whether that um, changes the estimates. Then we look at, we restrict the analysis to only those schools where at least 75% of pupils um, uh, underwent the test. Then we do some fancier things such as propensity score weighting or entropy balancing. And last but not least, in a sort of most stringent test, we um, only look at, um, we use school and family fixed effects to control for unobserved differences um, at the school or family level. But basically, regardless of what we throw at the, our results, they remain incredibly stable. Um, our effects remain nearly identical across all specifications and actually end up to be, end up being slightly larger for school and sibling fixed effects. And so this sort of um, suggests that it's not attrition that is driving um, the results um, of our analysis. Now, um, the question that remains is whether the effect the effects that we observe are actually, actually reflect sort of loss of knowledge learned or whether these are due to more transient sort of day of exam effects, right? And this is because lots of things obviously changed during COVID. And so students may simply be um, may simply be not used or yeah may not be used to the new testing environment or unaccustomed to the new testing environment or under stress and so they the the loss um the change in performance might reflect those day of exam effects rather than sort of um, knowledge learned and so we can see this we can actually examine this effect by looking at um tests that were also conducted in the same environment but that were not meant to uh, test curricular content. And so you can see here that if we, if we repeat the analysis for those tests, um, the effect size shrinks by two thirds, implying that knowledge learned is the main channel um, that is sort of uh, responsible for our effects. We also see quite some variation at the school level. So even though we observe a sort of three percentage point change on average, some schools um, fare, fare much, much worse than this. And some few schools on the other hand, seem to suffer only minor or no losses. And this sort of at, at, at face value suggests that, you know, decisions at the school and teacher level might actually play uh, an important role in mitigating the negative effects of or some of the negative effects of um, the school closures. And this is, I think, a really important avenue of future research, um, you know, especially considering or especially in sort of helping us think through the policies that might work in the future to sort of mitigate future learning losses or to sort of mitigate the existing losses that have already occurred. Great. So what does effect, what, what does sort of a three percentile point uh, uh, reduction in test scores actually mean? Um, measured as progress in a typical year, it implies that students lost out on about 15 to 20 percent of a year of quality, um, quality adjusted schooling. And this, um, this equates almost perfectly to the amount of time that schools actually remain closed for the school year, which means that, you know, so sort of the upshot of this is that students made little to no progress while learning from home during the first lockdown in the Netherlands. Um, 
and this is perhaps particularly concerning because the Netherlands in many ways is sort of a, was unusually well prepared for the challenges of online learning. The country has one of the highest rates of broadband adoption across Europe with more than 90% of households, even among the poorest quartile, um, having broadband access at home. It had a relatively short lockdown, a strong policy response, um, and, a, and a fairly equitable school system. And still we find these, um, these sizable effects, which suggests losses sort of many times larger in countries that weren't prepared um, in the same way. And in fact, in fact um, a meta-analysis by Pierre Engsel and, and, and colleagues suggests um, that sort of others, others um, countries have in fact sort of faced uh, um, harsher challenges. So here's our study. I'm sorry, this is a bit small, but our the effect estimates of our study are down here and sort of um, um, studies that have been conducted since suggest, suggest that other countries have been much more affected um, by, by um, these school closures. And in fact, sort of not only has there been an overall decline in learning, but there's also been an increase in inequality across most of these studies. Great, so with that, I'd love to um, wrap up this presentation. So just to summarize, um, school shutdowns due to COVID-19 have been um, the largest disruption to education that sort of um, that we've seen in recent years. Um, based on the results that we um, that we have um, that I've presented here, these disruptions will have dire consequences for learning um, for students um, who have learned very little um, compared to sort of what they would have learned in the previous year. And losses were uh, more concentrated among those students from less educated homes. Um, in our case, sort of students from students in the sort of um, category of lower parental education suffered losses up to 55% larger than their more advantaged peers. <clears throat> However, um, of course, there's sort of some important caveats um, with this analysis. Um, importantly, sort of other dimensions, sort of school is not only for, you know, learning, but also is incredibly important for non-cognitive development and for mental health. And so these factors likely play a really important role in, um, in these estimates and in sort of, you know, student well-being more generally. And I think we'll learn more about that later. Uh, another important caveat is that the first shutdown may have been more severe due to the abrupt nature um, um, of sort of, of the event. And so schools might be better able to, might have been better able to mitigate future losses as they have become more prepared or more um, attuned to the challenges uh, down the line. Great. So um, with that, I'd love to I'd like to wrap up the presentation. Um, thank you very much uh, for for listening, and I look forward to any uh, questions or comments that you may have. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that um, really interesting, uh, insightful talk. And we have a couple of questions in the chat, um, which I'll I'll go to first. So, uh, did you look at differences across socioeconomic deprivation status, or did you just use parents' education? Um, yeah, as a proxy. that's a great question. So, so we were somewhat limited in the um, amount of individual level data that we had um, available. At the individual level data, we had information on parental education, but we didn't have information on sort of income or um, parental occupation, which prevented us from doing an analysis, um, doing some some more detailed analysis on that front. But we had um, that information at the school level, and so we could look at, you know. We could look at um, the school level treatment effect and see to what extent that um, correlated with, you know, socioeconomic status or like a sort of deprivation level at this um, neighborhood or school level. And we find that there's a sort of similar negative correlation there, right? So, so that was, it's obviously not as sort of robust as the individual level analysis that we present in our main, in our main study, but but yeah, that's that was one way in which you tried to triangulate these findings. Great. <clears throat> that was sorry, I should have said that was a question from Jasmina. Um, and that actually speaks a little bit to Tristan's question, um, which is uh, did you look at any at the impact of school level characteristics? So did you were there any other school level characteristics you're able to incorporate? Yes, so uh, um, we have um, a wide range of sort of neighborhood um, variables, including 
immigrant status, so a share of immigrants in the neighborhoods or, or foreign nationals in the neighborhoods, um, depri neighborhood deprivation. Mm, I think those were the sort of two main factors that we looked at. And um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the most intense negative correlation was for neighborhood deprivation that we found. Um, um, and in subsequent analysis, sort of in subsequent robustness checks, we tried to sort of account for these differences as well in, um, and see whether that sort of changed our main results. Wonderful. Um, I've, I've got a quick question. Is there an opportunity to continue this on a longer term basis and look at potential like regains in learning loss over the next few years? Yeah, that's a great question. So in fact, we did, we did a follow-up study for um, um, where we looked at we repeated the analysis but and looked at um, whether schools and teachers were able to uh, mitigate some of these negative consequences. It's and we find that actually in, there seems to be there seem to have been a sort of catching up effect that has happened where um, where uh, progress improved overall. So the learning the the gap um, narrowed, but the overall inequality persisted. So we don't find the same learning overall learning loss, but we find a similar difference between advantaged and sort of students from uh, students with parents with parents with high education and students with um, a lower parental education. Um, that's quite interesting. What makes it a little bit more challenging is that um, the test was actually delayed, and so that obviously that obviously mean that meant that students had more time to prepare for the actual um, tests and we try to account for this but it's a little less clean i would say than the than the current study which was kind of nice because there was this you know disruptive school closure and then testing happened as it did in prior years for sure great thanks so much aaron um I, we're going to move on now so uh thank you thank you very much for that that was great um so yeah. next we have um tamsin new love